chapter 15. And we come to this, really this critical moment in the history of the church. Remember, we've been talking about the unstoppable mission, gospel, spirit, and church of God. Like, nothing is going to stop it. Nothing can, nothing will, nothing ever has stopped the gospel, mission, spirit, and church of God. It was ordained before the foundations of the world. It was set that God was going to save people through Christ, and he was going to use the church to do it. He was going to use the church to take the gospel to the world. And the early church, as we've seen in this study of Acts, the early church had some issues. Today, we're going to see a a defining moment in their story. Defining moment. And And it really... The entire trajectory of the first century church could be changed based on how they handle this moment. And as I was preparing this week, I started thinking about defining moments in my own life. And I remember over 20 years ago, arranging to take this young lady out on a date. And I was like overwhelmed with this young lady. I met her for for the first time in early September and I immediately had eyes for her in September of 1998, I met this young lady, and I immediately had eyes for her. It took like three months before we could actually get a date together, and then I think right around December the 10th, we went out on a date, and from that moment, over 20 years later, I've been wildly crazy about my wife. And let me just tell you, the point I'm trying to make is not how awesome she is, because I think she's incredible. And if you don't think that, then get out of here. Not kidding, not sorry. Uh, but you know what I'm saying? Like, like, the moment we went on this date, I had eyes for this young lady, and I was absolutely taken back by this young lady. And by God's grace, we were able to get married a few years later and grow our family together and start our lives together. But from that moment, had that date never happened, and it, lots of, like, lots of swerving around different roads to get to that point, Had that date never happened, the trajectory of my life would have been very different. Had that date never happened, the trajectory of her life would have been very different. So I hope that she would say that's a defining moment for her as well. Defining moments. Like, we think back to even my sons who are 9 and 11. There have been defining moments in their lives as well, where the trajectory of their lives change. Even my daughters at 12 and 14 See, we don't have to think too hard to think about these major moments where we could take one way or we could take the other way. But because of the path we took, it had decades worth of implications. Decades worth of implications. In Acts chapter 15, we see see the church at this theological point of no turning back. This, This defining moment for the church, and it's going to change their trajectory if they decide wrongly. It's a huge decision for them. And and at stake here is the gospel. The gospel of God's grace is at stake. And really the, the question is, is grace enough? That's the question the early church deals with in Acts chapter 15. This problem, is grace enough? what our band just led us and Nicole our our musical worship leader just led us through the greatness of God's grace by grace you are redeemed by grace you are restored and now I freely walk into the hands of Christ my Lord this incredible song and and at stake right now in this defining moment in the early church is is grace really enough We see this in Acts chapter 15. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Acts chapter 15. And we're going to work through some scriptures. We'll start in verse 1. The problem. It says, Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you were circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. This is huge. Because for the last few years, remember, the church at Antioch was was a melting pot of cultural backgrounds. Antioch is where Paul and Barnabas were. This is where these men came down to. They they come to the church at Antioch. 
and say, hey, wait a minute, guys. Unless you become and follow all of the rituals of the Jew, uh, the Jewish Old Covenant, Old Testament, you cannot be saved. At stake here, how they respond to this question in this defining moment, at stake here is the gospel. It's a defining moment in church history. See, remember, Paul and Barnabas had been sent out by this church at Antioch, and they, they traveled all throughout this region among the Gentiles. First, they would go to the synagogue, and then they would tell the non-Jewish people. They would start in the synagogue talking to the Jewish people. Then they would go to the non-Jewish people, pointing them to the greatness of Christ, pointing them to believe in the gospel, to turn from their sin, and to trust in Jesus. Like, not pagan rituals, not Jewish rituals. Paul had been telling them, Trust in Jesus, Jesus alone. And word got back. Remember, word, word gets back to the church in Jerusalem. And these guys come down and say, hey, wait a minute. Unless you become a Jew first, you cannot be saved. Are we saved by grace alone? Sola gratia? My kids all know that. See, I'm... I'm a theology geek, so in our house, if you come to our home and you open our cupboard, you'll see a bunch of plastic Miami cups, and then you'll see some glass pint glasses, like real glass pint glasses, that have all of the solos of the Protestant Reformation on them. And I use our dishware, just a new purchase for us. It was a Black Friday COVID brain purchase for us, but I'm using our dishware to catechize my children to make sure they understand the importance of the Protestant Reformation. I mean, I think they're cool, but... My wife just thinks I'm a nerd. Yeah, I'm a theology nerd, but that's all right. That's all right, whatever. But we use these, these pint glasses, and there's one that says Sola Gratia. If you were on our Wednesday night uh, Facebook feed, you would have seen I actually held the Sola Fide because Paul was teaching, where we were in Romans chapter 3, Paul was teaching on justification by faith alone, and I held the pint glass up and openly admitted to being a theology nerd. But Paul, at issue here, is the gospel that we are saved by grace alone. See, these men come down, and they say, hey, wait a minute. Grace isn't enough. You have to first follow all of the ritual of the Old Testament. See, this is a defining moment in the church. It's a defining moment in the early church. Well, we see... Ultimately, it's a question of, will we see Christianity as the complete completion and fulfillment of God's purposes in the Old Testament? Or will we see Christianity as just a sect of Judaism? Will Christians have to become Jews? It's just part of Judaism, like we had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and we got the Christians. Or does Christianity show the fulfillment and completion of all of the Old Testament? It's a defining moment. Also at hand was, will we continue in global evangelization, or will we just hang in Jerusalem? Will we continue taking the gospel to unreached people? Will we continue sharing and showing Jesus, or will we just hang in Jerusalem? Because if you've got to be a Jew first, yeah, eventually we'll, we'll just see if they just come to us. It's a huge issue. It says in Acts chapter 15, verses 2, 3, and 4, it says, And Paul and Bar Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument and debate. Paul and Barnabas and some others unstoppable was because God's mission, it is God's mission. God alone will complete his mission, and he just may choose to use you and me. You know how freeing it is to report all that God had done? Not like how awesome we are. Because let me tell you, there's always going to be some, someone better than you. There's always going to be someone better than me. There's going to be better preachers. There's going to be better dads. There's going to be better husbands. There's going to be better whatever I'm trying to do. There will be people better than me. But if I see that God has chosen to use me in a specific way, God gets all the glory, and I don't care if there are people better than me. I praise God that there are people better than me. You want to know what? I rejoice that there are greater preachers than Paul Helson right here in Bradenton. Can I tell you, I am happy for them. I am friends with them. My good friends, I, I have this one friend, I think he's the best preacher in all of Bradenton. I was telling somebody, like, I would be at his church if I wasn't a pastor. And I'll tell you who he is. Like, if you're unhappy here, I'll tell you who he is because you'd be fed really well the Word of God. 
But like, we should rejoice when people do things better than us because we see that the mission is God's. We see the mission is God's. Don't ever miss that. It's not your mission or my mission. It's God's mission, and he chooses to use us. And Paul and Barnabas understood that because they reported all that God had done. They reported all that God had done. But this issue is so serious, it's not just going away. In Acts chapter 15, verse 5, it says, But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them, not encourage, hear this, to command them to keep the law of Moses. Some of the believers, see, they were, this was a defining moment in the life of the church. This issue isn't just going to go away. Remember, the Pharisees were the leaders in the Old Testament. They were leaders at the temple, at the synagogue. Some of the Pharisees, who were also believers, told them, wait a minute. They missed the grace alone part. They said, wait a minute. They need to keep the law of Moses. Now, when, when they talk about the law of Moses, he's not talking about the moral law. And I think as a follower of Christ, we're called to follow the moral law. That's the third use of the law. It's a good thing. And it's a good thing for us to follow the moral law of God. They're talking about the ritual law, the ritual of circumcision, the ritual, the dietary limitations, all of the, the, the religious activity that Judaism was centered around. That's what they're calling them to. It says in Chapter 15, verse 6 and 7, Peter gets up. Part of their response, they look to Peter. The first half of the book of Acts, Peter is kind of our, our, is our main per person here. And we see good things that Peter's done, and we see bad things that Peter done. Just like in the Gospels, we see good things that Peter did, and not so good things that Peter did. But we see right here in Acts chapter 15, verse 6 through 11, he says, The apostles and el elders gathered to consider this matter. Notice this. They didn't just one person make a decision. Apostles, plural. Elders, plural. Plurality of leadership. The apostles and elders at the church of Jerusalem gathered to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you are aware that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth Gentiles would hear the gospel message and believe, and God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that, never, that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? Hear this point. The hypocrisy of their position was that you have to follow the law even though I've never been able to. You ever see any church people that act that way? Yeah, I think we've all been guilty of that before. It's hypocrisy that you have to follow the law even though I've never been able to. No one since the giving of the law, no one has ever been able to follow it. That's why Jesus came. It says in verse, verse 11, On the contrary, we believe that we are, saved by, we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. So here's Peter. He could have taken the easy way out. Serious debate and argument. He could have just backed off and said, yeah, 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 we're in Jerusalem. We're like in the capital city. And he says, no, the gospel is too great. We cannot, we cannot choose wrongly here. We have to point them to the grace of God, grace alone. See, Peter knows firsthand that God's mission and gospel are, were designed from Genesis chapter 12 all the way forward to be global. A global gospel, a global mission. If you remember a few hand, a handful of weeks ago in Acts chapter 10, we see Peter and Cornelius, a Gentile who feared God. We see this incredible conversion. Peter gets this vision in the word of the Bible to Peter. In this vision, this Peter, nothing is unclean that I have made clean. He's pointing them to, to the truth that God's grace is for the Gentiles and the Jews. It's for all people. 
here years later, several years later. We just we think of this as just a few chapters, but several years later, Peter boldly defends in front of the apostles and the elders, the church of the church, the truth that God's gospel is for all who would believe, whether Jew or Gentile, Jew or Greek. There is no distinction. Ethnic background doesn't matter. The gospel of God needs to be taken to all people. Paul would have written, I believe, earlier before this event in in Acts chapter 15. Some people think after. I'm not going to fight them on that, but the way I read the Bible, Paul would have written before these events in Acts chapter 15. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 through 29, he says, For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all in all one in Christ Jesus. And here's this last part. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. All that matters is that we turn from our sin and trust in Jesus by grace alone. That's what Paul would write. In fact, the entire book of Galatians was built on this premise that grace really is enough. And if, if we were to read Acts chapter 15 in the book of Galatians together, we would see clearly that grace is enough. It doesn't matter if you participate in certain religious activities, even now. What matters is the posture of your heart before God. Like your heart and my heart. What matters is, have we turned from our sin and are we trusting in Jesus? Not have we checked a bunch of religious boxes. Can I just tell you, like, the people that I've known throughout my life, I'm 43, I'll be 44 in March, and I've been in a church since before I was even born. Like, I make this joke joke that I was a Southern Baptist before I was even a Christian because both of my parents have been involved in ministry, my father in vocational ministry, his whole adult life. Like, I was in the womb of Southern Baptist. So I've, I've been around church people my whole life. And can I tell you, some of the grumpiest people I've ever known are the ones that don't understand grace. They don't get it. They don't get it. They think you got to check off 1,287 boxes. They would look at me and say, Paul, tuck your shirt in. Say, Paul, put on some real shoes. I said, you know what? I don't dress this way because I try to look cool because I'm 43 and overweight and I'm losing my hair. And what, I, what I'm keeping is turning white. So I don't need to be cool. Like, you don't look at cool in the dictionary and see overweight, middle-aged dude that's losing his hair and what he has left is turning white. Like, there ain't no cool about me. I dress this way because I'm comfortable and I'm a Floridian. Like, I want to wear flip-flops because I like flip-flops. Like, if you don't like it, go, go to some other church. But hear me, hear me. Some of the grumpiest people I have ever known in the church is people that don't understand that it, we are saved by grace alone. They say, Paul, take your hat off when you walk into the church building. And of course, you know, the pastor was my dad. When I was young, I would be like, okay, yes, ma'am. And then by the time I was a teenager, I was like, oh, yeah, where's that in the Bible? Show me. Is it one of the ten or is it more than that? Like, wh- where? Show me. Like, because I was, I had a quick response when people challenged my understanding of the grace of God. I'm kidding. I just was a rebel. And I pushed against every single possible authority in my life up until I was, have I stopped yet? I'm trying to, right? I'm trying to. By grace alone, I'm trying to kill the rebel. And See, there's a rebel that lives inside of me that I have to put to death. But you, you understand, some of you are laughing because maybe that's been said to you, like, man, don't put a collar shirt on. Now, I make my boys wear a collar shirt. Excuse me, their mom makes my boys wear a collar shirt. I don't really care. Like, I'm just glad that they're here and they're taking notes as they listen to the word preached. But you get my point. Some of the grumpiest people in the churches that I've been a part of my whole life have been people that don't understand grace alone. Because, see, when, when, when they see God save people, they expect them to act like the church people that have been in the church for 48 years. Even if they're 14. Even if they're 19. Even if they're 29. Even if it's all they could do to get out of bed and get to church on time. Grace alone. 
And I am so thankful that that was Peter's position. Grace alone. Because all of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation points to the unending grace of God shown in the person working ways of Jesus Christ that even the most wicked of us, myself included, can turn from our sin and trust in Jesus alone. Not Jesus plus anything. Not Jesus plus religious activity. Not Jesus plus being a good person. Jesus alone because grace is enough. And that's what Peter points them to. I'm so thankful for that. Grace alone. If you've never turned from your sin and trusted in Jesus, like five days till Christmas, do it right now. Turn from your sin. Ask God to forgive you. Believe in Jesus. Ask Jesus to give you a new heart and he will save you. Ask Jesus to change your life, to forgive you of everything you've ever done that has been wrong. See him as the son of God who lived a perfect life, died on the cross. But hey, here's, here's the greatest part. He didn't just die. He defeated the enemy that you and I are unable to defeat. He rose from the grave. Like that's what Christmas is about. Our nativity sets have a, 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 a baby in a manger. Mine does. But hear me, Christmas is about the cross where Jesus would pay the penalty of your sin and my sin and the sin of all who would believe. But on the third day, he would walk out of the grave and he would offer life to all who would turn to him and believe. Like, don't wait. Trust in Jesus now. If you're online, trust Jesus, now, do not wait. I'm not guaranteed another moment. Neither are you. Do not wait. Here's what Paul would write later in Galatians. Really, again, understand Acts chapter 15 and Galatians together. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. For both circumcision and, un and uncircumcision mean nothing. He's saying the ritual... Like the, 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 the ritual of entry into the Old Testament people of God, the circumcision means nothing. Uncircumcision means nothing. He says, what matters instead is a new creation. What matters instead is a new creation. We see in Peter's message summarized that grace really is enough. Peter's position is that grace alone is what saves us, that God offers his grace freely. To all who would believe. It says in verse 12, Acts chapter 15, verse 12, the whole assembly became silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describe all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. The whole assembly. We've seen in Acts chapter 13 and 14 the incredible things that God was doing through Paul and Barnabas. And they just tell them and say, look. God is clearly at work. God is saving people that aren't Jewish. God is saving people. And they proclaim the truth of the gospel. And again, because it's God's mission, they say all that God had done. Because it wasn't Paul and Barnabas' mission, it was God's mission. And they're just, just telling them all that God had done through them. Next up, James. It's James's turn. James, Jesus' brother. Now, remember, James would have grown up with Jesus. And while Jesus was still alive, James was not a believer. But at some point after the crucifixion, James becomes a believer. And he sees the beauty of his brother, now his Savior. Okay, so when, when you read the book of James, when you see th this James, remember there's, there's two James in the book of Acts. The first one was John's brother, James and John, one of Peter's closest companions for that three years. He was martyred already. By the point we get here, James would be an integral leader in the book of Acts, an integral leader in the early church, and he would write the book of James. This is Jesus' brother. He would come to believe and he would trust Jesus as his savior, no longer seeing him as just his brother. James's turn. He was a pillar of the early church. He says this in Acts chapter 15, verse 13. After they stopped speaking, James responded, Brothers and sisters, listen to me. Simeon has reported, that's another Another way to say Peter, he says Simeon has reported how God first intervened to take the 
to take from the Gentiles a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this as it is written. After these things I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up again so the rest of humanity may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name declares the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, in my judgment, we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God. But instead, we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from eating anything that has been strangled and from blood. For since ancient times, Moses had those who proclaimed him in every city and every Sabbath day he's read aloud in the synagogues. This is James's response. Hear me. He points to Peter's experience. He says, remember Peter's experience that Peter was just talking about. Like, Peter's experience mattered. He points to Peter's experience. But, but, but hear me. Peter's experience, yes, it mattered. It wasn't the foundation of James's argument. See, the foundation of James's argument was the scriptures. So if, if, you, if you have a Bible, you see in Acts chapter 15, verse 16 through 18 is in bold. He's quoting from Amos, the book of Amos chapter 9. See, James is pointing to the scriptures to understand Peter's experience. And we need to understand that as well, that that James is using the scriptures, and he says all of the prophets agree on this, saying the whole Old Testament agrees that God desires people from every nation, tribe, and tongue to worship him. Not just a group of Jewish guys, and we're not going to make everyone become a Jew first, and then they can follow Jesus. No, that's inconsistent with the scriptures. And shocker, the scriptures support Peter's experience. So we always have to be be understanding that when we talk about our experience, see, Peter's experience mattered, but it had to be understood through the scriptures. Peter's experience mattered, but it had to be understood through the scriptures. It says that he will rebuild David's fallen tent, where the temple in the Old Testament was the centerpiece of Old Testament worship. Now Christ and his church is the centerpiece of worship. See, Jesus has rebuilt through Christ the tent that fell. David's fallen tent has been rebuilt. Salvation isn't just for the Jews. You can't add anything to the gospel of God's grace alone. Not circumcision, not going to church, not working on the parking lot team, not giving money in the offering plate, not reading your Bible most days, not listening to Christian music or podcasting the greatest preaching. Nothing. There is nothing that you can add to the gospel of God's grace. And in this defining moment, this defining moment, the church turned to the scriptures. And they set the church on the trajectory. They kept the church on the trajectory of salvation by grace alone. Some of you may say, well, Paul, what about this list of of things that James gives them? You know, those those are things all that we're talking about, some form of idol worship, all four of those areas. We're talking about some form of idol worship. And he's basically saying, just watch these four areas So we can all eat at the same table and we can all see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and there won't be any cultural baggage between us. Salvation by grace alone. This defining moment. Can I tell you, as a follower of Christ, as a husband called to lead my wife to worship Jesus alone, as a father of four soon to be five kids. I want to lead my kids to trust in Christ alone. I am so thankful for how the early church followed the scriptures. They followed the scriptures. They evaluated experience through the lens of the scriptures, and they clung to the gospel of God's grace alone to save. I am so thankful. It's a defining moment for them to keep the gospel at the core of everything that they were doing. Let me just ask you. See, I, I shared about this defining moment in my life when Victoria and I went on our first date. And as incredible as that was, 
the most important defining moment in my life was when God saved me. I was a young boy and I was convinced of my sin. And I saw my sin for what it was, not just like I, I screwed up and mom and dad are ashamed because I had a colorful imagination. As a kid, I liked to tell a lot of lies. I was a compulsive liar as a kid. I saw my sin for what it was, not just disappointing mom and dad, but really a violation against the holiness of God. But by God's grace alone, God saved me as I believed in Jesus. Have you had that defining moment today? If you're online, have you had that most important defining moment today? For those in the room, have you experienced that defining moment? Because can I tell you, your life will never be the same afterward. The burden of my sin was removed. And as I keep repenting, keep trusting in Jesus, can I tell you, the burden of my sin today continues to be removed by God's grace alone. I pray that that is the case for you. I pray that that is the case for everyone that sees this video. If it's not, would you talk to me? Text me? Email us? Hit us up on Facebook? Something. Reach out to us so we can share with you more about the gospel of God's grace alone. Heavenly Father, God, you are good and gracious and we love you. Father, I pray. God, I pray that everyone who hears these words today would believe in Jesus, would turn from their sin and trust in Jesus. It's in his name I pray, amen.